Buckle up, everyone. You are strapped in and ready for the Insurance Hour with me, your host, Carl Sussman, the resource to help you navigate the world of insurance. There is a lot of misunderstanding about what insurance is and what insurance isn't. Let me help you demystify insurance and have some fun while we're at it. Informing, educating, and entertaining Californians one policy at a time, this is Insurance Hour. Hello, hello. This is Carl Sussman with Insurance Hour. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are live and you can catch us on replay and you can catch us live and you can catch us everywhere. Just to rattle off a few places, you can catch us on KMET, KSTE, KZSB, KFIV, KALZ. We're on YouTube. We're on Twitter Spaces. We're on podcasts. We're about anywhere you could possibly want. However, today it's all about you. It's all about you. Uh, I wanted to let you know that today we are going to be doing listener and viewer questions and answers. I've been getting a lot of them. People have been sending questions to questions at insurancehour.com. I also had a few voicemails that came in to 559-656-0317, which is where you can reach us anytime you'd like to ask a question. Or if we're not live, you'll leave a voicemail and we can either play it or I can just read the question. The couple that I have today ask not to have their question played out loud, so I'll just be playing it. And uh, we will we will jump in from there. Again, thank you so much for listening and let's get right to it. The questions as they come in. Now, I will, I'm going to read you these because I, I have a list and there's far more than I'll be able to get to for the entire day. I'll tell you that right now. But if I don't answer your question today, I'm, I will do my very best to answer it on the next round. Or if I haven't answered your question, feel free to reach out again and say, just email me back or just call me back and tell me. Let me know what's going on so I, have, uh, so I don't have to make you wait. Okay. Remember, you can reach us at questions at insurancehour.com or call in at 559-656-0317. Or if you really want to be fancy, you can just dial pound 250 on your cell phone, keyword insurance, and that will get you to someone that can help you right away. All right. And without any further ado, let us jump in with our first question that came in. This was a question that came in by voicemail. Gentleman was saying that he has a pickup truck that he does not drive very often. And he wanted to know, does he have to leave insurance on it? Which is a great question. So remember, when we're talking about insurance on a vehicle, we're talking about really two separate things. We're talking about liability protection that you have for yourself, and you're talking about the damage for the value of the actual vehicle, right? You've got two separate things. So what, the, what this person's asking is, well, I have this truck, I don't necessarily drive it a lot, or I'm not driving it at all. It was a little unclear. I'm going to go into the assumption that he's saying it's just parked. He does not drive this car anymore. So what some insurance companies will allow you to do is to put simply put fire and theft on the vehicle, which makes sense because that's the really that's really the only exposure that at that point you have, or that's the primary exposure that you have. There are all sorts of issues where somebody's stealing the car and running someone over and you're the registered owner, but we don't want to get into the weeds with that. Suffice it to say, if you have a vehicle and you're not driving it, it's parked, really parked, then you should be able to contact your insurance company and let them know that the vehicle is parked and not being driven and, and they'll be able to give you the option to put just fire and theft on it. Keep in mind, this isn't something you want to mess around with because if you do that, now the vehicle is basically uninsured if you do take it on the road, which you don't want to have. Sometimes the insurance carrier for your own protection will say, okay, if you're actually parking the vehicle and you're not going to be driving it, then I need some type of verification from the DMV. There apparently is a filing that you make for a vehicle that's no longer being driven and you can go ahead and literally Really make that filing with the DMV, and then you'll be able to provide that to the insurance company in the event they ask for it. So the, the answer in, in a nutshell is, if you do have a vehicle and you're not driving it, it is genuinely parked and not being used, there are options for you to go about so that you can actually have, uh, not, not pay for more coverage than you need. So hopefully that answers your question. Next question we had come in was asking, what affects my car insurance rates? We could do an entire show on this. Actually, I think I did not too long ago. But let me give you some general 
ideas, some general concepts of things that you should be aware of that are impacting your auto insurance. Right now, first understand that auto insurance countrywide is getting more expensive significantly more expensive. And there are lots of reasons for that. So I think what I'm going to do is focus primarily on those factors that are really outside of our control. We have questions later about what we can do to lower the rates. So let me give you a general idea of why are we seeing auto insurance rates going up the way they are. There are lots of reasons. The first reason has to do with the fact that we're, we're in this whiplash in, uh, position right now where during the pandemic, just a few years ago, I can't believe we still have to talk about it, but it's, it's, it happened and, and there you have it. During the pandemic, of course, we had people that were driving very little. Insurance companies in some states gave rebates and lowered rates and did things because there was less exposure for the insurance carriers. And so the consumers were getting premium back based on that. However, after that, as the pandemic ended and people started driving again, something strange was happening. First of all, they were driving a lot less carefully than they were before. The frequency for accidents and the severity for accidents was significantly higher than it was pre-pandemic. That's the first problem. And the second problem was the severity, the types of accidents that were happening were significantly more than they were prior to the pandemic. So if we just stop right there and we say, okay, We've had an actual shift, in a general shift, not just in one state or one classification of drivers, but we have a general shift in the behavior of drivers and the types of claims they're having. Then it stands to reason that if we're seeing more claims and more expensive claims, we're going to have higher insurance premiums. So that's, you know, mic drop. At that point, we can already say to ourselves, okay, that, that makes sense. However, there was more to it than that. We were also facing issues with supply chains. And again, you heard this back in the day. It was taking longer to get parts for vehicles. It was getting, taking longer to get parts for everything, to be honest. Chips were in short supply. There was little things that go in every car that uh, probably lots of them in, in cars uh, those were difficult to try and get as well. So now, not only were they having trouble because of increasing claim frequency and severity, the industry was also facing the issue of not being able to get the parts that it needs to actually start repairing the vehicles. And whenever a vehicle is still has an open claim and they're waiting on parts, the insurance company's forking over more money. And of course, when you're forking over more money as an industry, that's going to get passed on down to the consumer in the form of premium as well. On top of that, we have a shift in the types of vehicles that people are driving. We have vehicles that are simply more expensive to repair. The parts are more expensive, the labor is more expensive. If we look at electric vehicles and hybrid vehicles, which make up a large class of, of a large group of vehicles that are out there right now, what you'll find is shocking because what used to cost a few dollars I say that and that's a relative term. Let's just say a small accident used to cost a few thousand dollars in the event that there was a claim, a thousand, fifteen hundred dollars. That same accident now might cost six, seven, eight thousand dollars. And that has to do primarily with the cost of those parts, right? A bumper used to just be a bumper. And now a bumper has cameras and LIDAR and radar and all sorts of other sensors in them. And that costs a lot more money to replace. Plus, don't forget, you can't just slap the bumper on. You have to be able to have someone that's trained to be able to install the bumper properly and to be able to calibrate everything correctly. So you're looking at a higher labor cost to, to get that bumper repaired. So on top of that, we also have issues of what happens when we have more severe accidents. Forget the actual vehicle itself, but what happens when we just have more expensive accidents? And I'll tell you what happens. When we have more expensive accidents, that means that there's litigation costs that come into play. Again, what's starting to happen is the smaller accidents that used to be settled between the client and the insurance company or the client and the other person involved in the accident has now turned more likely than not into some form of litigation. And not making a judgment on whether litigation is good or bad, in general, it is more expensive because now you have another party that has to be compensated for their work, meaning that the insured is going to have to have a larger payout from the insurance company because part of it's going to be going to the attorney representing them. And again, if that means the claim is going to be larger, back to the beginning, we're all going to be paying additional premium because claim costs have gone up. 
So when we come back, I want to move on to the next question because we could go on indefinitely just talking about why rates have gone up. It literally is a whole slew of reasons, but it is, I'll leave you with this, just math. It's not personal. More after the break. Sussman Insurance Agency, trusted for generations in navigating California's complex insurance market. For help with homeowners, fair plan, auto insurance, and more, call 877-411-5200 or visit sussmaninsurance.com, your friend in the insurance industry. Hello, hello. Welcome back. Thank you again for being here and sharing this time with us. I am Carl Sussman, and you are listening to Insurance Hour. We are answering your insurance-related questions today, and I am actually going through and reading questions and giving answers to questions that were submitted by people that were listening, or if you're watching on YouTube, we're watching. Remember, you can reach out anytime by sending an email to questions at insurancehour.com, or you can call 559-656-0317, or if you are fancy fancy, you can also dial pound 250, use the keyword insurance, and that will connect you to an agent right away that can help you. So before the break, we were talking about why our auto insurance rates are going up. We know they're going up. So why? And we went over some very basic reasons that really have nothing to do with things that we can affect, right? I mean, one by one, sure. But in general, when we see costs higher for things, we're going to see premiums higher as well. It, it One follows the other. Insurance companies are purchasing things that are more expensive. Premiums to pay for that are going to be higher. So moving on to the next couple of questions. Uh, somebody asked how much insurance do they legally have to have? And this is a great question. Uh, I always try and be a little bit more specific. When somebody says how much insurance, well, of course, in my mind, I think to myself, well, are we talking about liability insurance? Are we talking about physical damage? Are we talking about uninsured motorists? What are we talking about? So let me break it out just a little bit. The law requires, and it's different in every state. So remember, your state may vary, and the pun still holds, your mileage may vary. Depending on the state you're in, the limits of liability that you're required to have will change. They will vary. It could be anywhere from 15,000 to 30,000 to 40,000 to 10,000, it's, it's all over the place. And what that's doing is the Department of Motor Vehicle is saying, all right, if you're going to drive on public roads, we need to be sure that you're carrying some type of protection in the event you hurt somebody or you cause damage. Now, you'll get some folks that say, well, I don't wanna have to be forced to do anything. I don't wanna have to buy insurance. And believe it or not, you don't have to. You can satisfy that requirement, that legal requirement that there is for you to be able to carry, for you to have to carry uh, an insurance policy by posting a bond. Certain states allow this, certain states don't. What this basically means is you're going to go and purchase a bond. It's usually for ten or twenty thousand dollars, and that might cost you hundred dollars. It's it's inexpensive, and you take that. That is your proof of financial responsibility. You file that with the Department of Motor Vehicle, and now you have satisfied your legal requirement to carry insurance. Now, this is a minimal, minimal, minimal amount of coverage, because keep in mind, you're not insuring your car at all. You are literally just buying a portion of li of liability insurance that would be utilized in the event of an accident, and it's a crazy low limit at that. For example, just as a comparison, those limits of liability, I haven't written those limits of liability in 30 plus years in the business. You just don't. It's it's just ridiculously low. It's somebody, you know, their pinky gets hurt. It's going to cost more than those minimum limits are that are required by law. So at least you can stand up proud and say to yourself, hey, insurance companies, I don't have to buy insurance from you. Yes, this is true. Most states will give you the ability to purchase a bond in lieu of that and still satisfy your financial obligation that the DMV has. Next one, can I insure a car that is not in my name? 
Well, there's an interesting point here that goes to insurable interest. And the concept of an insurable interest is you have to have a financial interest in something in order to insure it. The idea for an insurance policy is if you suffer financial loss, you are in essence reimbursed or you're made whole again or as close as you can be. So let's look at a vehicle. If I own a vehicle, let's pretend there's no loans on it, it's not leased, I own this car outright and the car gets stolen, I am now financially out that amount of money. I don't have the car and for whatever that value is worth. So my insurance policy will work with me to compensate me for that loss. Now, if I'm looking to insure, I don't know, your car, I don't have any particular financial, I, I, I have nothing, I have no skin in that game, right? If your car gets stolen, it doesn't affect me. I, I might feel bad. Uh, it might be one of those things. Maybe we carpool and it might affect me that way. But legally speaking, again, not an attorney, not giving legal advice, you need to have an insurable interest, meaning that you have to in some way have a detriment to yourself if there's a loss in order to have an insurance policy compensate you. You can't just run around in general and say, I want to insure that and that and that because they're not yours. You have to have an interest in them. You have to suffer financially before an insurance policy will reimburse you for that loss, which, which makes sense if you think about it. Next question we have, what happens if I'm in an accident with someone without insurance? I love this question. Depending on the state you're living in, you could be looking at anywhere from 10% on up to drivers that are driving around uninsured or with minimal limits that are for all intents and purposes uninsured. So what can you do? If you're in a state that has no fault insurance, we'll talk about that later, that's a different story. So we're talking about states that are in, that do not have no fault insurance. So if you are involved in an accident and the other person does not have insurance or does not have sufficient insurance, most states will give you the ability to, and this is beforehand, right? Not after the accident, before purchase what's called uninsured motorist and or underinsured motorist. And basically what this means is you are carrying liability insurance that they're not. At first blush, this kind of pisses you off because you're thinking, wait a minute, why do I have to pay premium for the other guy? Well, unfortunately, you can't force someone to carry sufficient levels of insurance. Believe me, I've tried over the years. You can't force people to purchase something even when you know that it's a good idea or it's something that you would recommend. So what you can do to protect yourself is pay a little extra in premium. And again, uninsured and underinsured motors is not anywhere near as expensive as your general liability insurance. However, what it does do is it gives you the ability if that person is uninsured or does not have significant enough coverage to be able to go to your own insurance company to try and recoup your damages there. So it's it's one of those bittersweet, right? It's frustrating because if everyone did the right thing and was ev and everybody was protected with the proper amount of coverage, it wouldn't be an issue. However, since that's not the case, at least there's a tool that we can utilize that will enable us to be able to purchase something that we can carry to protect ourselves. So that's uninsured and underinsured motorist. It's actually such an important coverage that in certain states, there's a specific mandatory form that the Department of Insurance says, you must sign this that you were offered the coverage. That's how important it is. So that's something to check on your policy. You definitely want to think about having uninsured and or underinsured motorist coverage. What's our next question? Oh, rental car coverage. Okay, this question is interesting and I get asked this question a lot and it's always uh, semi-entertaining to me. What does rental car coverage on my insurance policy mean? Okay, well, let's start out by telling you what it does not mean. If you decide to fly to Hawaii, plane stays together and, and you make it there and you, you need to rent a car, your rental car coverage is not going to pay for that. It's, that's not what it's for. Rental car coverage is not an insurance to pay for a rental car if you decide to rent a car on vacation. If you think about it, it makes sense really because you can't purchase insurance on something that you can voluntarily then just use, right? The concept of insurance is that if something unexpected happens, you have protection. If you have full protect, if you have the full control over what happens, then it wouldn't make a lot of sense to be able to have an insurance policy for it because you would pay a dollar for the policy whenever you feel like renting a car and they would pay $50 for the car. You would just do that. And of course, that, that doesn't work mathematically. 
So what rental car coverage is there for is it's going to pay in the event your vehicle is in a covered loss and you have rental car coverage or rental car reimbursement, it will then pay for you to have a replacement vehicle while that vehicle is being repaired. Makes sense, right? Because that's something that you are having a, an additional loss. Not only is your vehicle damaged, and hopefully you have coverage for that, you also don't have a car while it's being worked on. And as we talked about a little earlier, not having vehicle, not having your vehicle back quickly because of the parts shortages and the increased costs in getting all of these things done means you're going to be in a rental car a lot longer than you used to have to be. So rental car coverage is a big one. It's, it's definitely important to have. And the way it's purchased is in increments of how much you're going to get for the vehicle. Will they reimburse you for $10 a day for a car, $20 a day, all the way up, I've seen it to $100 a day for rental car reimbursement. And interestingly enough, the difference in cost between let's say $30 a day and 50 or $60 a day is not that dramatic. But let me tell you, when you're going to get a rental car and you go to the rental car place and you say, okay, what can I get for 30 bucks a day? And they point to something and you're looking at that and you're, and you're saying, that's not anything close to what I'm used to driving. It gets a little annoying. So take a peek at your policy. Be sure you have rental car reimbursement and understand that there's a limit that's attached to it as well. In addition to a limit, a lot of times there's a time frame. Usually it's a month. It can sometimes be more. Again, your mileage may vary. That, that pun, it just, it never ends. It's going to be one of those situations where you're going to want to be sure that you have coverage to be able to get you a vehicle that you're going to be comfortable with, right? Unless you're okay with it. And if you're driving a $100,000 Tesla and you say, you know what, if the car is in the shop, incidentally, those cars tend to be in the shop a lot longer because their parts are a lot harder to get. And you're okay driving a car that is significantly less sore than you're used to, fine then do it with eyes open and know what you're getting so you know what you're what to expect in the event of a claim. However, my experience tells me that the more expensive a car people are driving, the more frustrated they get if they can't get something similar to that while their car is in the shop. So check your policy, see how much there, how much per day you're getting for rental car coverage, and also I'll give you a little secret. When you're getting a rental car, you can usually negotiate with these guys. I, I know it doesn't seem like it, but you can. You, you can tell them, say, oh, you know, can't you knock it down to this or can't you knock it down to that? I don't know why that is. It, it's, it, it seems like the last place you think you'd be able to negotiate, but you can. So when you're getting the rental car, remember the insurance company is not going to hand you a rental car. They're going to say, okay, go get a rental car and we'll reimburse you. So what you want to do is it behooves you to try and take a little bit of extra time and talk with the rental car company and try and see, can you get it a little bit less? Or, okay, if I'm going to pay that amount, instead of that car, can I get that car? Can I get a little something bigger? Guilt works. I've seen that work well. You've got a family, you've got small kids, you don't want to be in a small car. Your car is usually, your, your normal car is a lot larger. Work with me here. They're, they're human beings. And, and the rental car market is is a challenging one in general. So keep in mind that if you do have that coverage and you are going and you're negotiating to get a rental car after your vehicle's in an accident, don't be shy about just looking them in the eye and saying, well, can you do better for me? There are other companies, can you do better for me? I'm just not feeling safe in that car. They're, they're, they're people too. You, you will get further than you might suspect. Okay, what is next? Uh, gap insurance. Oh, gap insurance is a fun one. Okay, what is gap insurance? <laughs> so I'm laughing because sometimes when I look at these, I'm thinking there's no reason. There's, there, it's so clear to me why insurance frustrates people sometimes. Let me get this straight. I have insurance, and then there's something I can buy that's called gap insurance. What is that? In case I don't have enough insurance, I buy more insurance. It, it's kind of funny, but that actually is not what gap insurance does. So let's look at an automobile again. If you drive your car, a brand new car, $50,000 car off the lot, that car is now probably worth 44,000, 40,000. It literally drops in value the minute you drive it off the lot. Vehicles depreciate, they don't appreciate. What happens is you still have a loan on that car. 
right? And your loan hasn't dropped. Your loan is what your loan is. So if the next day, literally right after you bought that brand new shiny car, you paid your money for it, you financed it, you have debt now for that vehicle. And that vehicle is, let's just say stolen. I hate to say it in an accent. Let's just say it was stolen. Now that vehicle is gone, but you still have that full loan that the insurance company is going to say, well, the vehicle is now only worth 40. And you're saying, oh my God, it's I, my loan is still 50 you're going to have a gap of $10,000. Gap insurance is a type of coverage you can get that will pay that difference between what the value of the car is and what your loan might be on the vehicle, which which makes sense. Again, it's, it's a frustration and you can check online all you want. It is a strange thing that vehicles tend, not tend, vehicles depreciate. Property tends to appreciate over time. So, Keep that in mind when you're getting a vehicle and you're purchasing insurance, if you have a loan or a lease, ask about lease loan gap coverage because that is definitely something that when you have a new car, if there's a loan or if there's a lease, the likelihood of you needing that in the event of a total loss is very high. Okay, moving on. Uh, let us talk about uh, what do we have here? We've got a gap. Well, this is an easy one. So we'll tackle this one right before our next quick break. And it's does, uh, does my insurance policy cover theft? And the answer is, if you have the correct coverage, it can. Typically, theft is covered under what's called comprehensive coverage, which I hate that name because it's very, it implies so much. It's comprehensive. The truth is all it does is cover damage to your vehicle while the vehicle is not in motion. That's hardly comprehensive sounding by the definition of the word comprehensive. Anyway, comprehensive coverage is normally what would pay in the event your car is stolen. And again, there are ways that you can purchase simply a fire and theft policy, which is different than comprehensive, but both would pay in the event that there is some form of a claim for a uh, for theft of your vehicle. And we're going to get to some more questions as soon as we come back. I am Carl Sussman, and you are listening to Insurance Hour. California's insurance market can be challenging, but Sussman Insurance Agency knows the way. Trusted for two generations in home, auto, and personal insurance. Call 877-411-5200 or visit sussmaninsurance.com. Navigate with confidence. Hello, hello, and welcome back. Thanks again for being here. I am Carl Sussman, and this is Insurance Hour. We are here to help educate you on all things insurance. Remember, if you have questions, you can email questions at insurancehour.com. You can dial pound 250 on your cell phone, use keyword insurance, and boom, you'll get to someone that can help you. And of course, you can call 559-656-0317 if you have any questions. If I happen to be live, We'll put you on the air. If not, leave a voicemail and then let me know if you want to be played on the air and I'll answer your question later. Magical, just magical. Before the break, we were talking about the theft of your vehicle, which is never fun, obviously. Nobody likes to have their car stolen and it does happen. There are some vehicles actually that have uh, such a history for being stolen. Kia I, comes to mind that certain insurance companies were saying, oh my gosh, I just can't insure these vehicles because they're too easy to steal and they're being stolen at volume. So it's an interesting story actually about Kia. If you don't know about it, check it out online and you'll find out how it happened and why it happened that people were able to steal certain models of Kia because of a small change. I mean, just the smallest change that they made and boom, there it is. All right, let's go on to the next thing. Oh, we talked about this earlier. What is no-fault insurance? Now, some states have something called no-fault insurance, which is, ironically, exactly what it sounds like. If you and I were involved in a car accident, shame on you, it's your fault. No, it's not. It's nobody's fault. If we're in an accident, with, with very few exceptions, then my insurance policy is going to pay for me and my damages, and your insurance policy is going to pay for you and your damages. 
period. Now, there are other, there are certain exceptions, and again, state by state, it can be a little bit different, and that might be things like severe injury or death involved. That can, in essence, crack that no-fault policy. However, the vast majority of claims, vast, vast, in states that have no-fault insurance, that's how it works. You carry your own coverage, other person carries their own coverage, and that's the way it works. You wanna be sure you have enough coverage? Buy more coverage for yourself. You wanna be sure that you have all the bells and whistles? You buy it, it's all for you. It's an interesting concept, and some states that have it uh, have lower rates than states that don't, and vice versa, right? We're a very diverse country, so it's hard to make a general statement that states that have no-fault insurance have lower premiums, period, because it's just hard to know for sure. And again, you can always find a way to have it look the other way if you compare it to a different state. But that's what no-fault insurance is. So you might take a peek at your policy and or ask your agent or broker, I'm just curious, are we in a no-fault state? If you're curious or if you don't already know. Next question is, what is a speeding ticket going to do on my... Okay, he's asking what, what's going to happen if he gets a speeding ticket. Well, let's, let's be an actuary. Ooh, sorry. Let, let, let's be an insurance underwriter for a moment. We have two people. They're exactly, they're twins. Let's make them twins. These people, they're the same age, the same sex. They have the same uh, everything. They're twins. They drive their vehicle the same way. They have the same job, the same usage for their vehicle. They put the same amount of miles on their car. Everything is the same. The only difference is one of them has a speeding ticket. Now, if I told you that you have to take your money and bet on which one of these two drivers is going to have an accident, which would you pick? Uh, it's a loaded question, but it's exactly as you would think. You're going to bet on the person that didn't have the speeding ticket. And again, this is one of those things that really irks people, and I understand it really irks people, but it's simple math. If you have a speeding ticket or multiple speeding tickets, the likelihood of you having an accident or a large claim are simply higher, sometimes significantly higher than your exact counterpart with all the same characteristics that has not had a, has not had a ticket. Some states will give you the ability to go to traffic school. I say go to, does anybody go anywhere? Take a traffic school class online because that's what it is. And the traffic school class will basically show you safer ways to drive, shame you, and in, 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 to, for doing that, you're going to get a certificate that you can turn into the DMV, and they will, in essence, take that ticket and pretend it didn't happen. And depending on the state you're in, some states let you do that every year, some every 18 months, some every two years. They don't want you to just keep getting tickets and just keep going to traffic school because that sort of eliminates the whole point, right? Because they don't see the, t the, the, the tickets don't show up and therefore you can't properly be rated. So not be rated, but be rated as a driver with a ticket or without. So my advice is if you do live in a state where you're able to eliminate that speeding ticket from your record by going to traffic school, it is always, always a good idea to do that because the chances are you are going to, first of all, you'll learn something. It's actually kind of interesting because what, we get our driver's license when we're 16 and we never really get trained on driving after that. That's pretty much it, open and shut. You go to one of these classes or you watch them and you sit through them online and, and sometimes you pick something up and you think, oh wow, I never really thought of that. So. It's always a good thing. What it will for sure do is prevent you from falling off of, falling off, falling into that category of, a category of someone that's had a speeding ticket. Because again, as we use in our example, it makes sense. You are going to be a higher risk driver. So your premium is going to be higher than your exact twin that did not have that speeding ticket. Same goes for accidents, by the way. People will ask sometimes, well, it's not my fault. The accident wasn't my fault. Why, why does that matter if I have 10 not at fault accidents? Well, let me ask you. Let's take our two twins again. Our two twins, everything is the same about them. They've even both had zero speeding tickets. They don't even have parking tickets, except one of them keeps having accidents. They're not their his fault, but he just keeps getting involved in accidents, not at fault accidents. Let me ask you, if you had to put your money 
on which person is going to be involved in an accident where it is the driver's fault, which one would you pick? Chances are you're going to say, I don't know, man, the guy keeps having accidents. Yeah, they're not his fault, but maybe he's doing something. You know, maybe he's braking hard. That's why he's getting rear-ended. Or maybe he's just driving in such a way that is a little bit off and people are hitting him. I mean, there's there's something going on. And there was an insurance CEO that I remember speaking with a long time ago. And he said that uh, in the state of California, at any rate, if someone is 49% at fault, okay? That's a lot, right? 49% that the insurance carrier cannot charge a different premium for someone that's 0% at fault because they both fall under that threshold. And I remember thinking about it and I was thinking, oh, that 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 kind of a problem. I can see that as, as, again, when you're trying to do a lot of heavy math and figure out what's the likelihood of somebody being involved in a serious accident, zero to 49 is a wide range. And to not be able to charge premium based on that I can see how that could be a problem. So guess what happens once you reach that 50% or 51% threshold? Now, is it that different than 49%? It's 2%. The difference is now the insurance carriers can charge for that accident because it's considered your fault. And they're going to, in essence, have to try and make up for the fact that there might have been nine other accidents that were not at fault. Not necessarily you, just in general. What that means is, instead of having what could be seen as a mild increase in premium for having an at-fault accident, you're gonna get whopped with a premium increase because of an at-fault accident. And again, this is a legislation issue more than anything, depending on the state you're in, and then Department of Insurance regulations, things of that nature that dictate what an insurance company can do and what they cannot do. And this is one of those times where at least in in certain states, if you can't charge a premium that is exactly reflecting the risk, you have to sort of do the best you can within the, you you have to stay on the tracks and stay on the guidelines. If the guidelines say you can charge no different premium for a zero to 49% period at the end, then you're gonna have no choice but to try and, but to have to charge a significantly higher premium when you do reach that at fault threshold. Make sense? Frustrating. But again, it has its pros and cons. But again, just keep in mind, a not at fault accident is still, you're still involved in an accident, right? And it is still costing, somebody's paying out some money. And statistically speaking, and this is proven again and again, over and over and time and time again, people that have not at fault accidents eventually have at fault accidents, which you stop and you think, yeah, I, I suppose that makes sense. I mean, if you're having enough, if you're out there enough and you keep having these accidents, the, the likelihood is at some point you're going to be in a position where you have an accident that's your fault. It's just just statistical, right? All right, we've beaten that one to death. What is an SR-22? Oh, this is a good one. If you're ever told you need an SR-22 finally, what does that mean? I should have looked up what SR-22 stands for. That would have been a nice little bonus for me to be able to tell you what it stands for. I don't know off the top of my head, but I can tell you what it is. And SR-22 is a specific form that gets filed with the Department of Motor Vehicle in your state that is proof that you have insurance. That's it. It's just proof that you're carrying an insurance policy. Why is that important and why is that necessary and why is it that some people have to do that? They have to have an SR-22 filing and some people don't? Well, it's interesting. Let's say you're involved in an accident, a bad accident, and you have no insurance. As a condition for you to be able to maintain your driver's license, the Department of Motor Vehicle might say, okay, we'll give you your license. We need to have proof that you are going to stay insured. You're going to be a good citizen at this point, right? You're going to do what the law requires by carrying insurance. So an SR-22 filing is basically a communication between an insurance company and the Department of Motor Vehicle, letting them know that an insurance policy is active and in force. What happens if you stop paying for that policy or it lapses? Well, the SR-22 filing will notify the, I'm sorry, the insurance company will notify the Department of Motor Vehicle, hey, this person you wanted proof of insurance no longer has a policy and you can guess what happens from there. Nothing good. Okay, uh, how do I file a car insurance claim? Well, this depends on the way you have purchased your policy. 
You can either contact the insurance company directly. You can contact your agent or broker. You can contact, you can file a claim online. You can call an 800 number usually. Some companies let you file claims through an, their, an app on your phone. Some will let you send text messages. I mean, it's, it's wide open. What I want to tell you about filing claims that's important is that one of the most important things to do when you're involved in an accident is to t- file the claim timely. Timely mean, what does that mean? Within the minute, like you just got smashed, you go, oh, hold on, grab the phone. No, I'm not talking about that type of timely. You don't want to wait days and weeks before you file a claim. You don't want to try and put yourself in a position where you have to try and explain to the insurance company, well, why didn't you file this claim sooner? Perhaps they could have taken care of it and the claim might have been smaller. If you try and negotiate it yourself right away, you might be in a position where all of a sudden the other party Funny thing happens with people when they're involved in a car accident. If nobody's hurt terribly and they get out of the car and they go, oh, they scratch their head and oh, I'm sorry, oh, you all right? Yeah, I'm all right, fine. Oh, how are you doing, blah, blah. This strange phenomenon happens after the next day once they've talked to their friends or their cousin who's an attorney or whoever. All of a sudden they start feeling some pain or they start having a headache or they start thinking, hmm, you know, that really wasn't my fault. I, I want something. And insurance carriers know that. And so they it, it behooves them to try and get claims handled and settled before it starts festering and turns into more of an emotional nightmare. Because that really is what it comes down to a lot of times. And I'm not poo-pooing people that actually get injured in automobile accidents. Believe me, I've been involved in an accident that had fatalities of close family members, so I'm not. I'm talking about the smaller accidents that, let's face it, in the larger scheme of things, you probably would just be fine within a couple days or a week. You ice your, you take some, put some ice on yourself or take some Advil and, and you'd be okay. I'm talking about those accidents that somehow people decide or come upon at a later time period. Those are the accidents, by the way, also that are starting to increase the costs of our insurance premium because the carrier might have settled it and everyone was happy with a couple grand. And if you wait and you're negotiating with the person and going back and forth, they finally get mad. Then they're saying they're hurt more. Now it's the ten, fifteen thousand dollars case. There might be an attorney involved. And again, all of those costs inevitably get passed on right back down to you. So keep in mind that you do want to file your claim as quick as you can. You also could be in jeopardy of avoiding your coverage because most insurance policies specifically state that claims need to be filed in a timely and reasonable manner. Well, that's pretty open to interpretation. I can promise you it's not weeks, right? It's going to be less than that. We'll get into a few more questions right after this break. Again, I am Carl Sussman. Please remember to call in with your questions at 559-656-0317 or send an email to questions at insurancehour.com. Back in a flash. In a tough California insurance market, you need expert guidance. Trust Sussman Insurance Agency with a legacy of understanding complex coverage needs. Call 877-411-5200 or visit sussmaninsurance.com. Treating clients like family for two generations. Hello, hello. Uh, Welcome back to the final segment of Insurance Hour with me, your host, Carl Sussman. Remember, I love answering your questions. That's really what I want to do is I want people to have a better understanding of what their insurance policies are, how they work, how they can get the best price they can, how they can avoid the pitfalls that sometimes can happen. So feel free to reach out literally anytime. Email me at questions at insurancehour.com. Dial pound 250 from your cell phone, use keyword insurance, boom, you'll get right to one of the licensed agents, or you can call in anytime at 559-656-0317. You're not gonna wake me. I'll either answer the phone or you'll get a voicemail and you can leave your question there and I will get back to you. Also, if you're watching this on YouTube, feel free to leave a comment and I'll leave you, uh, I'll, I'll get back to you there as well. And again, I'm here to help. That's what I like doing. I know it's kind of odd, but it's what I like to do. Before the break, we were talking about some issues of reporting claims and how quickly you should be recording a claim. And I guess we left off by saying, 
let, report the claim as soon as it happens. You can't go, you, you usually will not go wrong that way. Okay, next question is, are family members covered under my insurance policy? Hmm. Okay, well, let's talk about that. And this is, again, one that's going to be very policy specific, right? The language in the policy will dictate the answer to that overall. So I could stop at that point, but let me give you some general guidelines to be aware of. An insurance policy charges premium based on the driver, right? This makes sense. Young driver, old driver, driver with tickets, driver with accidents, who knows what it is. If you have a driver that's in the house, you should list them if you want them to have coverage. If you don't list them, what happens? Well, let's see. In general, the insurance carrier does not know that driver is in the house, which means what? They're not charging premium, right? So what would your expectation be that they would pay in the event of a claim? Do you normally have claims paid when premium's not paid first? Usually not. That's not the way the insurance policies work. Now, there are some exceptions for someone that might be staying in your house, a family member you know, um, for a day or two, something like that. And again, your mileage will vary on this. Always check with your agent and find out. However, in general, the rule of thumb is, and again, I think it makes sense. Please tell me if you disagree. If you list the driver, expect to have coverage. If you don't list the driver and pay premium, I wouldn't expect to have coverage. And I don't see how that's wrong. That's kind of the way the world works, right? What do they used to say? No tiki, no washi. Okay, what is the difference between personal and commercial auto insurance? A lot, a whole lot, a whole lot. And let me just give you a few highlights. Commercial insurance, we're talking, commercial auto insurance, we're talking typically about different types of vehicles, okay? I'm not talking about the artisan that might have a pickup truck, even though that might be a commercial auto. I'm talking about the cherry pickers, right? The big trucks. I'm talking about the cement trucks. I'm talking about the buses, the, the taxis, things that are clearly not personal use vehicles and or not used in personal situations. Those require a special policy, a commercial auto policy. Now, those policies are underwritten, meaning they're looked at entirely differently than personal auto policies. They look at driving record differently. They look at the limits of liability differently. They look at the type of business, the usage. It's, it's a totally different animal. So if you're ever not sure whether you should have a personal auto policy or a commercial auto policy, definitely check with your agent or broker or check with the insurance company. Tell them what the vehicle is, tell them what you do and find out. And I know you might be saying, well, I already have coverage. I don't wanna, I don't wanna mess with it. I hear you. But again, you don't wanna be in a policy that's not correct because in the event of a claim, they might not pay the claim. And, and you don't want to be in that position, right? You never want to be in a position where you have the wrong policy and then the insurance company says, well, we, we can't pay the claim because you're misrated or you're, the policy form is incorrect. So even though I know nobody likes to rock the boat and they always think, oh, if I do this, it's, it's just going to mean more money. What's, what makes more sense to you? To pay a little more money, if it turns out to be the case, and have coverage or pay less money and maybe not have coverage at all. Then you're just spending money for nothing. Food for thought. Can I cancel my car insurance at any time? Well, this is a good this is a good question. I think what they're asking is, is there any type of financial penalty for canceling my auto insurance? I think that's probably what they were asking. And the answer to that question is it depends. Some insurance carriers will prorate, meaning they will give you, if you have if you've paid for six months and you cancel it in three months, they'll give you a refund for three months. And some will do what's called short rating, where you're going to get penalized for canceling the policy early. Some will have a minimum of 25% premium that is what's called fully earned, meaning you buy it today, if you cancel it tomorrow, they're keeping 25%, period, end of story. Some carriers, it depends on how many times you've renewed with them, right? If you've renewed the policy once or twice, they'll prorate it. If you cancel it in the first policy period, they might short rate it. So if you're looking to cancel your policy, and of course, that's only because you're going to another carrier, you're not going uninsured, right? Right? Okay then check with the carrier to find out. Again, these are not unusual questions and these are fairly black and white. You should be able to find out pretty pretty specifically what to expect in the event that you're going to cancel your policy and what your refund would be and what it would be based on. Next question is, what is the declaration page? 
or deck. They keep talking about it. <laughs> I like that. They keep talking about it. Well, at least you got uh, this, this person who emailed this in knew that a deck was short for declaration page. Now, the declaration page is that first page in the policy. It's the policy that is made specifically to you. Right, everyone has, as you can imagine, when they are with the same insurance company, they typically have the same auto insurance policy. It's not unique just to you. What's unique to you is that cover sheet, that deck page. It's going to show your name, your address, the limits you've selected, your drivers, your premium, all of those things. And that's, the, that's again, what makes the policy unique to you is that deck page, not the policy itself. It's going to be the deck page. So that's what that is, and that's why people are always talking about it, because that's your policy. That's, the, again, what makes it unique to you. That's where you're going to find information about what you've purchased. So if somebody says, well, what are my deductibles for my car? Where would you look? On the deck, on the deck page, because that's the page that's customized for you. Just remember, the deck page, the declaration page, that's all about you. That's specific to you. All right. One more I want to get into, and then I want to I want to tie it all together with a bow. What happens if I let my insurance cap um, coverage lapse? Is the question, and the answer is horrible things because Murphy's law. That is when you're going to have an accident, and I'm saying that sort of as a joke, but sort of not because if I told you how many times I've seen that happen, it would blow your mind. It just does. It does happen. I don't know why. Okay, if your policy lapses. You have a few options, and again, this is carrier specific. Depending on how long the policy has been lapsed, the carrier might reinstate your policy if you pay the premium. Some might reinstate your policy with a lapse, meaning they won't pay for that period of time you are not covered. It really just depends. It depends on the insurance company. So again, check with your agent or broker. Go on auto pay because Murphy's Law is real, I'm telling you. Get that policy so it renews and it's paid automatically and it's not on you because I don't trust the mail, I don't trust email, I don't trust anything with insurance. Put on auto pay, be sure that it gets paid and don't worry about being uninsured. That is the most important thing. And with that, I want to thank all of you again for being here today and spending this time. Hopefully you've learned something. Hopefully you've learned a lot because we've gone over a lot of things. Again, I'm here to help. So if you have questions, feel free to reach out. 559-656-0317 is the phone number. You can email questions at insurancehour.com. And again, dial pound 250 keyword insurance. And again, I thank you and drive safe. I do want to thank all of you for taking the time to listen today. I know insurance is not necessarily the most sexy concept. It's not the most exciting thing in the world. It is important that you understand what it is you're getting, what you should be looking for, red flags, you name it. You just need to know more than you used to. Things are more complicated than they used to be. If you have any questions, please reach out to me directly. You can email your questions to questions at insurancehour.com or call and leave a voicemail at 559 559- 656-0317. Educating and entertaining Californians one insurance policy at a time. This is Insurance Hour. The show is dedicated to Shamrock Papa.